this is documentation, the why, the how, the do it now. Um, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, this is my first time giving this session, so sorry if it's a little rough around the edges, uh, but I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, do, 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 do. So here's the agenda for the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction uh, about myself, my company. Um, then we're going to do like a kind of high-level overview of documentation in general uh, and talk about like different types of documentation, the differences between like those types, uh, and just talk a little bit about like documentation from high level. Then we're going to go over the five W's of documentation, um, the who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to talk about how to write good documentation and, and certain things that make documentation good. Uh, we'll kind of wrap up with getting people on board because uh, sometimes that can be like pulling teeth. Uh, and then I'll leave you with some final thoughts uh, and resources. Okay. So. You might be wondering who this tall, bespectacled person is yelling at you at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday about documentation. Well, hello, I'm Kimana Botts. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a software engineer at Nerdery in Chicago. Uh, a couple of fun facts about me. I had a laser tag whirly ball wedding reception. Uh, I am currently working on a board game based on my two dogs and my very like aggressive rabbit. Um, <laughs> No goats in that game. If you've seen my other talk that I give, it references goats. <laughs> I don't actually have a goat, so it's really kind of a bummer. Uh, and my default mood is aggressively grateful. I'm just like super excited all the time and just like amazed that I get to like live this cool life that I get to live and, uh, you know, go around places and talk to people about stuff that I think is real cool. So that's me in a nutshell. Like I said before, I work at a pretty swell place called Nerdery. Uh, we're based in Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis, or Bloomington, Minnesota, but uh, we have offices in Chicago and Phoenix. Um, and we have a bunch of remote people. Uh, kind of the, the vision of the company is to relentlessly invent a world that works better for all. Um, and we are, uh, we take companies from today to their digital future, working uh, at the leading edge of strategy, design, and technology to help our clients evolve and thrive. So we're kind of a digital agency. Uh, also, we're always looking for cool folks to join our team. Um, we are currently hiring like a bunch of different uh, positions, technical and non-technical. So if uh, you want to talk to me after this, I'm talking to me. We'll chat. Uh, okay, so the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's get into uh, the most riveting, exciting subject known to man. I'm talking about d -d -d documentation. Wah, 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 air horns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so what is documentation? Uh, documentation as a concept is kind of like very general. It can take many and any form. Pretty much people define it in different ways. Um, if I, you know, just went up to a person and was like, What's, what do you think of when you think of documentation? They might be like, oh, that's like a wiki, or um, maybe it's comments in the code, or maybe it's like a readme file on my module. Some even argue that uh, code and APIs are documentation in and of themselves. Um, also, just a little note, uh, not going to be getting into the to code comment or not to code comment uh, because that's just a different talk uh, that I do not have the energy for. It's just like, it helps me understand stuff, whatever. Come on, it's fine. Uh, so, yeah, documentation has many different forms. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we're going to be just like generally referring to documentation as something that provides information about either how a system uh, functions or uh, provides information about the context surrounding the decisions behind that functionality. So um, 
digging a little bit further into types of documentation, um, documentation obviously can vary significantly depending on context and audience and the goal of the documentation. Um, we'll look at some documentation for a uh, module on D.0 a little bit later and just kind of like look at the different types of um, documentation that is like sprinkled throughout uh, that project. Um, but like on that note, even referring to like the same feature and in, in, like from the point of like gathering requirements on a project to like implementing it to testing it to like writing um, like documentation like writing some like a document to help like um, CMS users and, and uh, end users be able to interface with that that feature like from point A to point Z the different types of documenting that people will be doing are going to be vastly different and that is like good because sometimes you don't need to like list your requirements and your readme you don't need to like if, if I'm writing testing instructions I don't need to put in like code snippets um, so context is a huge uh, differentiator in documentation um, yeah and, and it's just like this huge swath of things uh, so for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be focusing on how docs and why docs. So when I say how docs, I'm talking about um, things that provide information about like how a system functions or operates. Um, these can be things like uh, um, like tutorials. You'll you'll tend you tend to find things like code snippets or like terminal commands, things like that. If you're if you're Walking through the functionality of something, you're looking at a uh, how doc. Um, why docs provide uh, reasoning and context behind like why a thing operates, why it operates, like what decisions went into choosing to implement a feature this way versus this other way. Um, these are going to be these tend to be more like word focused and um, very uh, like high level and like regression test plans that would be Regression test plan. I would almost say that's more like, oh, sometimes I don't fit real neat. Okay, regression test plans. Let's circle back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just ponder for a bit. Um, but yeah, so how docs, you're gonna find code snippets and stuff. Why docs are gonna be like largely word focused. Um, so some people, um, in one of the, the articles that I, I have in the, the resources, um, they make the argument that like code, if you're working on like a technical project, your code is going to be the source of truth for um, all of your. It's like it is the source of truth, and everything else is an approximation. Um, but like, it doesn't always make sense, obviously, to dig through code to like understand things, and there are things that code can't communicate. Like, um, it's it you can see like how a thing is being implemented but if you don't have that added context of like well this argument comes in as json and so we have to do some finagling here to like do a thing like there's there's business logic that can't be expressed purely through like writing code um and so you kind of need both to get like a good holistic picture of a system because like one without the other uh, is um, you're not you're not getting the whole picture, right? Uh, but again, context matters. Sometimes you don't need all of them all the time. Uh, do, 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 do. So um, now that we've kind of gone over the kind of like overview of code or documentation, uh, we're going to talk about the five W's of documentation. First, who should be writing documentation? Funny you should ask me on these slides. Everyone should be writing documentation is the short answer. Uh, long answer is that everyone should be contributing to documentation um, at some point in the process. 
uh, you might have like this like really robust documentation plan and like one person like manages all the documentation, but everyone should be involved. Um, it doesn't have to be like the most technical senior person on your project. It doesn't have to be uh, like just a project manager doing so. Like everyone on the team has something to contribute to documentation, especially because everyone on the team is coming from like different perspectives. So one very good example of this is um, recently I onboarded onto a project um, and there was an established like readme and like an established system for like okay this is like the documentation we have to set up your local environment. Um, I followed those directions and then was like this is broken uh, and basically having gone through the process with like fresh bright eyes and a bushy tail uh, I was able to contribute to that documentation even though I was like on the project for maybe a week um, having gone through that process all those nightmares were still fresh in my head and I can be like don't use this version of node it'll break everything and you'll cry um, so uh, I was able to like write down that stuff even though I was just like in the context of the project like just like the little little baby person just not not fully like onboarded just kind of floating there like I'm just I'm just here you know um, and so by adding those little gotchas just augmenting the existing documentation with those like teeny tiny gotchas took me all of 30 minutes to like copy paste some of like the commands and just be like I ran into this and this is a solution um, I was able to contribute to that documentation and then someone else onboarded a couple weeks later and was able to get their local environment up and running just because like that information was there. It cut out a lot of process and we'll talk about that later uh, a little bit more in detail. But to uh, answer this question, everyone should be writing documentation. Um, if you do something that someone else is likely going to do another time, like if it's something that someone else is going to repeat, you may as well write it down, right? Um, because if you write down the, like if you're doing stuff that people are repeating and that's not like documented anywhere and you're always like following the same steps, this is, this seems to be a process that you're like likely not going to change or this is something that um, isn't going to be like, you're not going to have to like rush and update the documentation and then like run away and then update the documentation again. It's just your, it's, it's a process that someone else is going to follow. There should be some kind of, that is a good indication that that's a thing that you could write down. Um, and because it's a thing that you've just done, uh, you have that context to provide like, you, you have context that to provide like a fresh perspective on like running through the steps. Um, it doesn't need to be the great, greatest technical detail. Uh, as a matter of fact, putting in like the greatest technical detail um, might be a hindrance to your documentation um, because it makes it less readable sometimes or like less digestible. So as long as the pertinent information is being communicated, um, then that is sufficient. Um, and not only is it sufficient, it's desirable. You want to like do the minimum amount of documenting you can so that you have the minimum amount of stuff to maintain. Um, so as long as you're being like concise um, about it, then things should, uh, like you, you can, you don't have to be like the expert on the thing. What should you document? Uh, when I look at documentation, I start by asking these three questions. What knowledge is needed for you to do your day-to-day -day job? Uh, what does your team need to know to function effectively? What are areas of friction or ambiguity in my workflow? So, um, if I, I, I kind of want everyone to like just take a take a second to think about this these three questions. Um, what knowledge is needed for you to do your job day today? Um, for me, I need my local environment uh, because I'm a developer. I need my local environment to be set up correctly. Um, I need to be able to get databases. Um, I need to be able to manage configuration and, and things in the code base. I need to be able to use Git and um, work with uh, those kinds of workflows. Just 
things like that that are just kind of like high level, I don't want to say basic, but like high level essential things of my day, my, my work day. Um, what does your team need to know in order to function effectively? Well, my team uses Jira and um, we use GitHub and we use Confluence, we use PHP Storm, uh, and we're a Drupal, we do Drupal. So in order for my team to function effectively, like we need to be able to like agree on the process of like the Jira ticketing system. If everyone's using tickets differently and everyone's putting different kinds of information in tickets and we don't have like a set thing about, oh, well, I think a ticket should have acceptance criteria and like if it's a bug ticket, steps to reproduce. Uh, I think a ticket should have uh, user stories. Like if, if, if all the tickets are just kind of all over the place and we don't know how to function as a team uh, with like a consistent workflow that is replicable across people, then our team is going to explode and it's going to be real bad. Um, similarly, again, we all need to agree on how to use Git. Um, and we need to um, have simple things like team norms. Like how, are we, how do we communicate with each other? What is the process for that? Like are we going to communicate largely via Slack? Are we going to communicate via email? If I uh, do a code review and I leave a comment on your code, do I send you a Slack message letting you know that I updated your, your pull request? Um, do I tag you in the channel? Like just little things like that just uh, can, uh, and you don't necessarily have to get that granular, but um, that's where it comes into the third question. What are the areas of friction or ambiguity in my workflow? So if I do code reviews and I find that people aren't responding to my comments, then maybe that's a pain point. Maybe we need to address how we're communicating with each other. So um, part of this question is um, defining what the key aspects of your, your job function are and making sure that like those key aspects are getting addressed effectively. Um, and if they're not, identify the pain points and the things that are preventing those from being addressed. Uh, does anyone have any, any thoughts, any, anything they want to share, what, like, what kind of knowledge is needed for your day-to-day? -day? Anyone, anyone have any interesting answers to these questions? From what you said about tickets, yeah. um, what I'm doing mostly right now is like data cleaning. Mm -hmm. And then, just reminding me, it's like, yes, it's, it's really difficult when you have data just all over the place in every kind of different format and trying to standardize it and bring it into a standard it's a pain. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the comment was that data cleaning and trying to like standardize and bring everything into like one centralized place um, when everything's kind of like spread apart and not like consistent mm -hmm. is like a pain. And that, yeah, totally have experienced that for sure. Does anyone else have anything they want to share? How do you handle when, when, uh, <coughs> when you're basically working at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, cause you know how sometimes like you have the all like go all good intentions <coughs> to do, you know, to document and make sure that you have a certain processes in order. But when you're working where it just seems like it's constantly like constant deployment and there's no real downtime, when do you find time outside of your off work hours? <laughs> So how I tend to address that is uh, wine, like a bunch, and be like, hey, we need documentation, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too. Um, but uh, also just, I'll like beef up my estimates if I, um, if I think a task is gonna take me like, we use story points, but let's say a task is gonna take me like two hours to complete. I'll say this task will take me um, three or four hours to complete, um, because in my head, documentation, like creating the necessary documentation and, and having like the appropriate uh, ticket workflow and all the appropriate information where it needs to be is like like part of the acceptance criteria. Like I can't call a task complete if like the information's not there, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, if I'm just like, code, and then it's just like lost in the ether. That doesn't feel complete to me. And in theory, that's what I do. Uh, in practice, it's, it's a little bit hard, because obviously you're juggling like client expectations, or like you're juggling deadlines, and like mm -hmm. all this stuff, and it's, it, it gets real tough. But um, yeah, and again, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but just making it part of your process, and um, pushing back when possible. Uh, yeah. So we're going to move on to what should you document? Just some quick examples. Uh, environment setup for, from a technical side. Environment setup, Git workflow, custom code implementations, development workflow. From a non-technical side, things like ticket workflow, points of contact. Like if I need to ask someone a question for like clarification about like a user story, do I ask my lead? Do I ask my project manager? Do I ask a client partner? Who do I talk to to get the answers that they need to be effective? So like making sure people are aware of that is like a kind of like baseline low hanging fruit that people can just grab and be like, these are the people to talk to about these specific things. Uh, things like team norms. Uh, what are everyone's working hours? Uh, how are we going to communicate? What do we do when conflicts arise? How do we handle feedback? Things like that. Role expectations. Um, if you're like a senior dev, do you handle deployments? Like, what do are you expected to respond to like incoming client tickets or like bug issues and stuff like that? Like, what is that process like? And just internal processes again, um, just general internal processes. If there's like, this is how we do retros, or like this is this is what our our sprints tend to look like, this is what it's expected of like a sprint planning meeting or whatever. So just things like that. Just um, I'm a huge proponent of documenting process. Process is a thing that will rarely change. Um, or if it does, it's a thing that it's like a big change, right? Process is slow to change. Um, and so making sure you document that helps to remove ambiguity when new people come on, or it helps you um, eliminate ambiguity uh, if people have different understandings. So where should my documentation go? The short answer is where people can find it. Uh, the longer answer is that it depends on the type of documentation and the audience. Uh, it, again, wouldn't make sense to painstakingly document like technical decisions or like technical details in a wiki that's like primarily used by non-technical users. Um, just as you wouldn't put like your business requirements in the repo, your, your like readme, uh, where all your code monkeys are doing code things. It's like, it's not gonna be useful. Um, so you can put uh, documentation in, in various places. Um, so it's, the rule of thumb is like, as close to the thing that it's documenting as possible. Um, barring that, central location. Um, so, <clears throat> if I am working on a feature and I I am doing something that's like a little bit like out of like out of the norm for this like code that I'm I'm writing because it has to like interface with something. That's weird. And there's like a decision that I'm making about that code. Um, making an inline comment being like, I'm doing this because um, this input's wonky. And so to ha handle that uh, effectively, I am taking this approach. <coughs> um, you can also like put things in your readme. Uh, readme is a great place um, to put technical things because if you are implementing a feature and you need to add documentation um, or you need to like let everyone know that once this feature is merged in, then they're gonna need to run like these three commands or else their local environment's gonna explode. If you do the code and then while you're like formulating your, your pull request, just put that in Put, it, like, put that information in your readme with a date, then people know like, oh, I'm running into an issue, let me check the readme first, where like developer notes are, and let me see if there's anything updated in there. Versus saying something like, oh, this is merged, and so 
Um, I'm posting it in Slack, but then it gets like lost because of all the lovely communication that's happening. And so maybe it's not pertinent to you right that second, so you lose it. But I'm very guilty of this, where um, Slack and messaging and email is just the worst thing for my productivity. And so I have a tendency to ignore it, or I, I've gotten to the point where I need to like rearrange my work day such that when everyone is communicating on Slack during work hours, I am not in the middle of doing anything like super involved such that I can like just jump on feedback or whatever if I need to. Um, so yeah, things get lost in Slack, things get lost in emails. Um, it's, it's hard to manage that stuff. So having a reliable place that people don't have to dig for, just make it like as easy as possible to access this information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when should I write documentation? Now. Do it now. Do it right <laughs> now. Do it. Um, but really get in the habit of doing it. Um, it's, 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 a, it's like a muscle that you have to work out. Um, you'll get in the habit and then it becomes easier and you become more efficient at it. You get better at like discerning what needs to be documented. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's just, it just start now. Because I guarantee whatever you're working on could benefit from it. Like it's just, because everyone knows we should be writing documentation, but no one does it for uh, any number of reasons. Um, least of which is like, I gotta bill some hours and the client wants this thing yesterday and now I'm just gonna like make it go out the door and not like write a little thing about, hey. Um, so yeah, like if you get in the habit and make it a priority um, just as an individual, it becomes kind of ingrained in your own personal like workflow, especially if you can figure out a way to like document things either as you go through or um, like right after. Uh, if you write documentation right after you've completed a task, for example, it's fresh in your head and the environment is already set up if you need to take screenshots. So um, <clears throat> recently, I guess going back to that, um, going back to that original like local environment setup example that I, I gave earlier. Um, in that case, as I was going through the, the local environment setup, I was just taking a quick screen cap of um, the error, the giant horrible red errors in my terminal, um, and then like dropping those into a Google Doc and putting some notes, or just sending them, sending them to myself on Slack and, and adding a little note. And then later, once I had successfully completed the um, setup, I just kind of compiled those into like a confluence document and um, just like put it somewhere where I could find it again or where other people could find it. Uh, and it was just as easy as, well, okay, I know I'm going through this process and I know this is an anomaly, so let me just like capture this. And that made it very easy to just, to just like compile it and throw it off. So if you can integrate um, documentation into your workflow, it just becomes second nature. Uh, so yeah, and uh, big question, why write documentation? Having good documentation is gonna increase your team's efficiency and improve workflow. Uh, it'll improve your communication between teammates and foster a better understanding of the platform. It will also help to mitigate areas of ambiguity and minimize assumptions and uh, raise a little thing called the bus factor. Uh, has anyone heard of the bus factor? Is it throwing people under the bus? It is not throwing people under the bus, okay. uh, <laughs> but it's similar. Uh, so the bus factor is how many people in your organization or on your team need to get hit by a bus before everything just falls apart. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, if you have like one very shiny rock star lead person just hoarding all this knowledge in their big old precious noggin. And then uh, I like to think of it as like the lotto factor and they just like win the lottery and just like bounce and they don't come back to work and they just oh. disappear. Oh. You know, much happier, much happier. Same effect. Yeah. 
So, like, how many people have to leave, uh, either because of buses or because of lotteries, um, before your team just, like, crumbles to the ground, maybe catches fire, who knows, um, but before that knowledge is lost. Um, so documentation helps you increase that number, because if knowledge is shared, then your, your system is a bit more robust and it's not as fragile. It can't just be like toppled by pulling out one tiny card. Um, so yeah, that's a bus factor. But improving your team's efficiency and, and, and workflow. So again, going back to the local environment setup, uh, here's the scenario. I have a README and I'm trying to follow steps A, B, C, D. Um, I follow steps A and B and I get an error. There are no like errors or anything. Like, there's nothing in the documentation that like helps me with this. So I have to pivot, send a Slack message, and then go back to what I was doing, maybe Google the error message. Um, just so someone else on my team could help me or I could find the answer on Google. Um, someone else on my team is like, I see your thing, try this. I try it and it works. On to task D. I try it and I get another error that's not documented anywhere. I go back to Slack, I'm like, hey, please help. And then I also Google the, the error. And then someone else has to read the Slack and be like, okay, here's the thing. Here's the solution for that. Um, and it may or may not work. I try it out, what if it doesn't work? Then I go back to Slack and then ask a person and then they like respond to me and then I'm like Googling. It's just this whole like so, loop of um, context switching, right? I just want to do A, B, C, D, but instead of just doing A, B, C, D, I have to do A, B, Slack, Google, Slack, mm. C, okay, cool, C, works, great. Uh, D, nope, Slack, Google, Slack, try it. Nope, back to Slack. Back, and it's just all over the place, right? And that's just me. Because on the other side of that, I have this presumably more senior person who is also doing work, who has to like stop what they're doing, notice that there's a new Slack message of a person asking for help, dig through their brain and all their vast knowledge about, oh, I remember experiencing this thing, here is a solution for that. And then go back to what they were doing, wait to see if like, the thing that they suggested works, because if not, then they have to offer another solution. And so that's two people that are context switching, trying to solve the same problem that has already been solved for everyone else on the team. Um, and that's not great. Uh, so the other side of that scenario is the updated README that has these common errors that you might experience while doing your environment setup. That goes from like A, B, Slack, whatever, whatever, to A, B, O, I found this in the readme, it's there, I'm trying this, okay, cool, it worked. Uh, okay, try D. I see this, it's, it's still working, or it doesn't work, what if it doesn't work? Okay, there's another thing in, in here, let me try this other thing, it doesn't work. Then I ask someone, that eliminates this like, whole level or two of like, looping and pulling other people in. It prolongs, it like lets that other person continue doing what they're doing and not have to solve problems that have already been solved. So that's a way that uh, documentation can improve workflow and uh, commun communication. Um, also, uh, people say that the best way to learn something is to teach it. And I'm a firm believer in if you can't explain, I mean, at least for myself, if, if I can't explain a concept to a child, um, then I don't understand the concept enough at its base parts. So if you can't write some concise documentation about the thing that you've just written, you need to think about it harder maybe. Uh, because maybe it's a little bit too complex or like maybe like what what is preventing you from breaking the, this thing down into like very simple pieces? Just the meat and potatoes, you know? Um, Mitigating areas of ambiguity and minimizing assumptions. Uh, documenting content type architectures or whatever. Like these are the fields that are gonna be on this content type. Uh, so, so I was on another project, for example, 
I was working on a migration, and simultaneously, the front-end developer was working on styling the components that were going to be the content would be migrated into. Um, and because of this, uh, we had to. Um, there was a lot of like exploration of the source data that had to happen, um, and so there's a lot of points at which we needed to align based off of like design comps and like just images, something that, that the front end developer had made about like images and design comps that they received versus what needed to happen just architecturally for this data to like exist in the new system, right? So there is, um, so that process ended up looking like breaking down all of the source fields into target fields um, and figuring out like what components um, would need to be created and what, what would have certain fields. Like it was a lot of like manipulating um, and like working both backwards and forwards. Uh, but at the end of the day, like we helped to eliminate, eliminate assumptions about like that the front end developer was making about the back end and also that I was making about the front end because there was a disconnect there. We were making like slightly different assumptions. And when you're doing a migration uh, or you're just like trying to style a component and like the names are different or it's not in the right uh, region of the page that you think it should be in, then thing, things break and you have to go back and fix mistakes. Okay, so how to write good documentation. Uh, good documentation should be concise, simple, and navigable. If you remember nothing else, remember these three things. Concise, simple, navigable. Concise because people just like stop reading, right? Mm -hmm. You want your uh, documentation to be digestible. There's no point in like writing a novel. Like what is the point of writing documentation if no one can use it because it's too complex or too wordy. Uh, you just want like the bare minimum information you you need, like you can get away with to get the point across effectively, right? Simple. Again, maybe don't add like complex charts or or things like that because when your docs are too complex, that means they're uh, they're fragile and they are more prone to going stale. If they're very complex document, if it's complex documentation, that means when you go in and try to like update it, there's this whole like degree of complexity that you have to like take into account, which slows down the documentation process. And navigable, you need to make sure that people can get to the documentation. Documentation is useless if people can't read it. Uh, so. Um, how to write good documentation, decouple how docs and why docs. And again, how docs um, are how a thing operates, why docs are like the context and reasoning behind it. How docs are considerably more likely to change. The context and the reasoning behind like a feature or something like that, significantly less likely to change. Um, so especially during refactoring and also, don't forget to update your documentation with refactors. It's terrible. Painful, hurts, I'll cry, I'll feel it in my soul. Just remember to, to, to update as you update. Uh, also, don't over document things. Again, like you want the bare minimum because the bare minimum means you have less to maintain. But it also means that people have less things to like dig through to find what they're looking for. Pri prioritize quality over quantity. Um, and again, keep them where they can be easily found. Uh, so here are a couple of different approaches. There is the rubber duck approach. This is my preferred approach because this is largely like, I, I, the documentation that I do or I've been trying to do has been largely like process based. Um, so the rubber duck approach is to talk through the thing that you're documenting and then write down what you say um, because that's, like talk through it as if you're explaining it to someone um, and then and then just write that down. Uh, voice recording and text to speech, great tools for this. Voice recording especially like on Macs or like screen, 
Windows has this like, I can't remember what it's called, and I forgot to put it in my slides. Snag it. Snag it, but it's like a thing, and it like records your screen, but it also like. Oh, snags. yes. Well it's, it's, well, it's part of like the whole like, like that whole like snag it suite. Yeah. They have one where you can like, you point and it zooms in and, it, and you can talk and do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Yeah. It's part of that whole suite. Yeah. And there's like another, th it's like, it, like it, it'll like write down user clicked this button thing. It's, and it's like built into like Windows 10 or, oh, so cool. And it, it makes me really envious of like Windows people for like work stuff sometimes. Um, <laughs> find it again because it yeah. was great. Yeah, I always forget uh, about that, that it's even there because it's not obvious to find. No, it's not, but it's so cool. Uh, but yeah, there are tools and they're there. Um, <laughs> so use them because they're great and people worked really hard on them and they make your life easier. The API approach. Uh, if you have an API, just like anything that is publicly accessible needs to be documented. Um, and I have this cool little formula for you. Just like describe the thing, short description, provide like an example or two or like a use case, and then like point out some edge cases. Move on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, that's basically, that's, yeah. Um, getting feedback, very important. Cunningham's Law is the best way to get the right answer on the internet is to not ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. Which is to say that like, once you make documentation, especially if it's for like a team-wide process or something like that, share it. Share it to your team. Because like, at the very least, if you're, it's like sometimes it's easier to like point to a thing and be like, that's wrong, than it is to like make up a thing. So even if you just like get a draft out and you're just like, look at this, please, um, then they can like they have something to point at and like either agree or disagree, um, and you can just keep making iterations on that as, as necessary. But um, just like just like do it. Feedback is super important. Uh, getting people on board. We have, we have like a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna speed through this. Nope, that's one minute. Uh, basically, um, people don't like doing documentation because uh, it's words and stuff and uh, they don't want to prioritize it over like thing can sell. Um, so sometimes the best way to do it is just to like start and then let people know that you have that documentation and then they can see the value. Like there, there have been times like very recently where I just like added documentation and um, people have used it and it's made like almost an immediate impact on my team which is great. Um, if you, if people say it goes stale too quickly, then you're not focusing on the right things to document, right? Focus on things that don't change. Uh, focus on like why docs and, and uh, don't over document. Like the, going stale too quickly is like a sign that you are over documenting or documenting things a little bit too granularly. Um, I didn't become a developer to write words. Uh, <laughs> Writing the words makes you better at the code, and also talking to the non-code people. So write the words. Uh, it also like makes you not have to answer questions about the code you wrote before, because they're already answered. Uh, taking time to write documentation is expensive. Time is money. But you know what? Context switching costs time. Repeating yourself costs time. Dealing with blockers costs time. Fixing preventable, pre preventable mistakes. They're all expensive, and they all cost time, and they're all very frustrating. So like, write the docs, because it's better than doing all of those things. You'll, you'll pull your hair out less, and like your platform will be just like that much more stable. Um, here's resources. I'll tweet out this slide deck. Uh, I'll try to, I'll add the, the clicky Windows documenter thing before I tweet cool. it out, but yeah, that's, I think that's my time. It's 11.46. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>